everyone, you're watching Speak Your Mind with Dr. Riger. I'm Nez Alawi, founder and CEO of Join Mesha, the New York-based company that empowers women on a daily basis. I'm here today with Dr. Risa Riger, our clinical psychologist and investor in Mesha, and our guests are our very own Mesha mentees, Jess Levy and Charmia Zurel. Hello, Dr. Riger. Hi, Neza. Hi. It's always so interesting to have this show with you, but it's always fun as well. So um, can you just share with me something positive that happened this week before we get into the theme of the, this episode? Sure. You know, one of the things that I really love is that sometimes there's and sometimes and often there really is great wisdom that comes from young children if we listen. And so I was um, meeting with a mom and young child and this child, who I've known for a little bit of time, um, said, Dr. Riger, uh, could you help me with another way to help calm my feelings down when I'm upset? And so that was a great moment. I mean, here's this young child, younger than what I call, younger than two hands old. So under 10 years old. And this child already had the concept that, that, that they could be able to calm down, that they could be able to calm themselves down when they became upset and they needed just another strategy in order to be able to do that. And frankly, that is such a spectacular moment because there's the idea and the absolute belief that if I can learn some ways that I can have some mastery over my emotions and to get that understanding and develop that when you're starting out below two hands old is something that you have for your whole life. So that was great. And Neza, now I'm going to turn around and I'm going to ask you, you know, what was something positive that you experienced during the week? We'd love to know. Well, um, Dr. Riker, when I hear you, I just find it so promising to look at the future and the next generations and how they are more advanced. So I will return to an experience of today when I was talking in the incubator program that we produce at Join Meshad. I was talking to the mentees and a lot of the learning lessons that we're sharing there are lessons that we're still sharing with women in their mid 40s, in their 50s. So to see that they are, they have access to that learning at such a young age where they're figuring out who they are, who they want to be, how to get out of those feelings of, of guilt and, and uh, pressure that we put on ourselves as w women and figure that out at such a young age, I am seeing them as future power leaders and it just gives me so much hope. So That's just great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So today's show is returning to college and new so social boundaries. Um, we know that it's a challenging conversation for those of, of us who are parents or family members of college-age students, the theme of going back to college. So Dr. Riger, let's discuss the symbolic nature of becoming an adult during this time period and at the importance of having the college experience? College can be one of the best experiences and also one of the most challenging experiences. Uh, because college, if you're going away to school and you're boarding, which each of you are, um, each of you is, I, I forgive me for that, um, that it's, it's not piecemeal, it's really all at once. And all at once, you have to be, uh, you know, responsible for your own schedule, making sure that you get, to, you know, your food, that you have to wake up, that your laundry, if it's not done, hey, you're going to have to go into, you know, your uh, your hamper if you have a hamper or mower. Typically, go onto the floor and find the cleanest of your dirty underwear to put inside out and put back on, and that you're also in charge of your finances to a certain extent. And so it's a huge step that happens all at once, in addition to um, 
sharing space with people that you don't know, sharing bathrooms with people that you don't know, learning how to navigate that type of give and take and not have your parents there, you know, with you or your your family, whoever it is that, you know, that a student has been living with prior to going to school, to college, as there, as the person who is the reminder, who's the voice in your head and who just, you know, is that person who just knows like, I'm not hearing any noise and it's just must be about time for them to get up. I'm just going to go and knock on just to make sure that they're up and going and that's not happening. And so it's this step where it's negotiating life on your own, where there really isn't anyone telling you what you have to do at that point. And so the one of the challenges of that period is being able to go into what your internalized voice is, that internalized voice that has helped you, that you've heard, you know, at different times in your life in different ways, be your cheerleader and hold it onto your into yourself and rely on what you have inside of you rather than externally to help you navigate what your life looks like at this point. Dr. Weiger, when historic events happen, they always have an impact on society. Um, the generation of, of this um, freshman, uh, junior um, and, and, and graduate that, that couldn't celebrate their graduation uh, in, in, in a usual way. What could be a potential impact on related to those college students that have spent half of the year in their home and that go back with a lot of uncertainties uh, next year? It shakes out in many different ways. One of the things that happens is when you're back at home, you're back at home. And so you're not living life the way that you used to. In addition to that, even when, when students come home for the summer, usually their friends are around, they can go out, they can socialize, they can have jobs outside of the home. And so there's still a great deal of autonomy and self-regulation, regulating your schedule, regulating how much sleep you're getting or not getting, how much fun you're going out and having. And so that that is no longer in practice over the course of this time that people have been home for, an ex for extended periods of time. And so that's one component of it. And so then there's the re-entry. And people people come in with all different ideas about what safety looks like. And one of the, one of the pieces of this time of uh, brain development is that the prefrontal cortex is not fully online. The prefrontal cortex is not fully formed. And, and part of this extended adolescent brain, which makes teenagers just so fantastic and um, and confusing at times and difficult at times is that because of where the brain is at this point in time, that there's novelty seeking that goes on. There's social engagement. There's a need. The brain needs that. There's emotional intensity and there's creative exploration. And so when we have that, when we have those incredible um, aspects of the teenage brain, and I don't mean teenage up until 19, I mean teenage up until 25. That's what the, that's the developmental phase of the, you know, the adolescent brain, is that with, with college, that there are the opportunities to learn what your risk assessment is. And now, and, and so there's the courage of adolescence, the courage of, I don't like what's going on. I'm going to make a change. I know what I know that I can do it in these parts of separation, individuation, and really finding your own identities. There's an exploration that goes on, which for parents can be wonderful and scary simultaneously. And so we have another component of risk. And unfortunately, it's a risk that we can't see. We can't tell. 
where where our risk lies. And so when we have the, the courage, the courageousness, the wanting to engage, the novelty seeking, the exploration of adolescence, of the adolescent brain and young adulthood, and we put that alongside of, you know, the usual risks that happen, you know, you don't want to drink and drive, you don't, you know, you want to be careful, be careful with your own safety. And that we also mesh that up with the, you know, with the dangers of, of COVID. It's a space where we've got one side, not necessarily an absolute congruence with the other side. And there's also the idea of, you know, hey, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm strong, I'm good, I'm this and that, and it's not going to happen to me. So we see a lot of, of you know, a surge of, of virus with people, with younger people who were thought to be immune to it, you know, previously. So we've got that going into going into college uh, this year. In addition to like, people haven't seen each other, they want to get together, they want to have a good time. And so Rather than going in with your pedal, you know, with your foot on the accelerator and ready to go, you also simultaneously really need to have your foot on the brake. And that's a really tough spot to be in. It's a tough spot to go back into your dorm or into your apartment and see your friends. What do you want to do when you see your friends? You want to hug them. You know, you want to hug them. You want to, you know, share something with them. You have a great new coffee or whatever. You've taken a sip. You want to give it to them for them to try it too. You're eating something great. It's like, you know, you know how I know how it was in college. It's like, hi, this is great. Here, you try it, you know. And so there are all these from the small things like that where where it's our nature or it's like it's what our what our instinct is to do that and that we have to one hold back on that and also hold back on that in ways that are really not consistent with who we are as human beings and of coming back and seeing people that you know that you haven't seen in months so it's 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 such a a, a space of of challenge of, you know, how do you have the joyfulness going back to school and engaging with your with your group and at the same time, really keep up what you know and keeping your, you know, the knowledge that you have, the knowledge base, what you've been practicing and taking it to your college campus? Because what would we all wish? We would all wish that when you get to college, it's a bubble. And in this in this wonderful bubble of intellectual stimulation, a buffet of social opportunities that we can just go in and just, you know, just kind of be back and be back and make up for what we missed out. I'm, I know I'm saying we, I'm putting myself in there as if I was a student going back to college because it can be a really great time. And at the same time, remembering that it's unfortunately, it's not a bubble and that there's a prudence and an additional thoughtfulness that needs to be brought into the situation. So how do you, I think part of the challenge is how do you hold on to the enthusiasm and the wanting to be back and being safe for yourself and for people around you? And being able to be in community and how do you mesh those expectations and different levels of, of, um, of safety and feeling in control? There is so much um, capacity building in the personality of the young adult in the college experience. Um, I, I always thought that it, it's not, it doesn't really matter on what you study. You might not know at that age exactly what you want to do for the rest of your life, but just taking that experience of being independent, being in an environment that is not protected by your parents and figuring out the social life while being structured and, of course, learning something that is interesting and that will always serve you, whether you continue in that field or not. Um, yes, so let's hope that um, that, that college life uh, continues. So, Dr. Riger, the, the stress and anxiety doesn't just apply to college students themselves, but also to parents, professors, faculty members. 
how do you think that institutions of higher learning should really prepare the return to school beyond the logistics, but more at a level of psychological support? I think that one of the things that's really important to introduce, because there's been so much divisiveness in our nation, sadly, that in going back to school, that the idea, the messaging, and the commitment to community is really going to be essential. Because when you're in community and you're truly in community and there's an expectation that there's going to have that's going to happen and that there's accountability for it. So it can't just be as a oh you know we want to have community but also what does community mean? What is the responsibility of being in community? And in a community, what are we like with the people next door? What are we like with our roommates? What are we like with people at the next dorm? And what is our social responsibility as a community? And so, and there are aspects of this of even if maybe I don't firmly believe it for myself, what is it that I need to do to be part of the community and be a responsible member of a caring, compassionate, individualistic, you, you know, you don't, you don't have to give away your individualism. And I think this is where there can be a stuck point um, because you can be, when you're in college, oh my gosh, you can be as individual, individualistic, passionate, and compelling with your intellectual ideas your creativity, what you, how you navigate your thinking and develop it, what you can do with that, how you can manifest it, that there's an enormous amount of freedom, creativity, and individuality that occurs and can occur on a, on a university campus, along with being a responsible member of a community. And I think that that is where the colleges, the universities, the faculty, and the, the president of colleges, and people who were there really need to live it and make it very, very clear that it's not just an idea. It's not, it's, it's not just an aspiration, but it's an aspiration that absolutely must have implementation and action. And so it's it's this extraordinary opportunity in some respects of really building community. And so that's that's my thought on what colleges can do and how they need to, to do that. Because if you can be a part of something and really feel that you're a member, and this is what your membership looks like, and you get support from the people around you, and there's that expectation of one another. It's an interdependence. That's what community is. It's not. It's not. It's an interdependence. It isn't like um, like codependency, but it's interdependence. How do we work together and be ourselves and still be part of you know the the greater good and building something even more. And so it can be an extraordinary experience in humanity, individual, individual, internal building, building one's own resilience and fortitude and strengths and and taking on this kind of challenge. And at the same time, you don't have to give up your individuality. And, and we know, Dr. Riger, that it, it hasn't been the age group that was the most cautious about um, uh, about the entire protocols of safety. So, so it is also a pressure, I think, for those college students that were cautious and were in an adult environment, for them to return in an environment where suddenly they're being judged for being too stiff about the rules. They're being looked at not cool enough because they're wearing a mask when the party is going into, you know, like, hey, take off the mask, let's be more social, come on. We live in the same corridor, we know each other and so on. So uh, how, 
how can we avoid again? You, you know, the work at Menchad, we're all about diversity and how yes. can we make sure that there wasn't there isn't again those living groups that get created. And there is nothing wrong with living groups, but how can there not be that animosity? We suddenly we're the good ones and we look down at the other ones because because they're just because they're another group. They're not our group. Mm-hmm. That goes back, in some respects, Nessa, that goes back to the aspect of community. And community doesn't mean homogeneous. Community doesn't mean that we all believe the same thing. We all look alike, we wear alike, we do alike. But that's not what community is. That is, you know, that's not, that's not it. The, the challenge of community is to really make community when there is diversity. And, you know, I remember when my kids, when my kids were, were, you know, were teens and they would be in all different kinds of social situations. And I said to them, I said, look, you blame me for other sorts of things anyway. So if there's ever a situation that doesn't quite feel comfortable to you, blame it on me and just say, oh, my mother, you know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I've got to go. My mother, blah, 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 you know, she's, you know, she doesn't let me have fun, whatever, whatever that is. So one of the things that that is important is that to come in before you go back to really think it through and think it through for yourself and to have your own internal North Star. What are the things that are really important to you? And how do you manifest that going back in? How do you enact that? And that it's important to find other people as well who are, who can understand where you're coming from, even if they may not necessarily agree with all of it, but they can understand where you're coming from and they can support you in that. And so that, you know, one of the things about about being in young adulthood, of being in emerging adulthood and young adulthood is that there's safety in numbers. I mean, this comes, this goes way, way back to our earliest, you know, to primitive times is that when you hunted alone versus hunting in groups, you know, you, you did better, you surviving in a group is better. And so that's something that, that teenagers are, you know, our teens and our young adults feel very, very strongly intuitively. It's like, I need to be part of a group because there's an aspect of that's where safety is. And so how do we, you know, stay with part of a group? And so what I, you know, one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, there's like, stand up for someone, stand up for this. And if you feel that what's going on isn't safe, you don't have to stand up for it because, and and hear what I'm saying about that. It's not about needing to stand up because you're already standing. If you believe this, you are already standing. You don't have to stand up. You're already standing. And it's consistent with who you are. And all you need, if you have yourself and your conviction and there are people around you who you know it feels similarly, you're not going to be, you're not going to be alone. And that there are going to be more people around you in the administration, in your RAs, in people who are part of faculty, who are going to be there with you and stand are standing already with you because you don't know faculty who are coming in and out. You don't know, and no one knows if they have a, a child who's immunocompromised or a parent or an aunt or somebody that they're responsible for. So it's not just going to the, to the self, but it's really taking in the compassion and possibility and empathy of someone else's life experience. And that there's there's no one who would want to feel that they were responsible for a young child becoming very, very ill or an elderly person really being in, into the terrible throes of illness. No one would want to be responsible for that. And so it's it's being able to think beyond the moment and beyond oneself. 
that's not an easy thing to do. And we certainly, you know, certainly adults aren't always the best examples of that. And so maybe that's a space that you guys do it better. It is a very special year. Um, there was COVID, but there is more that we're going to be talking about. Let me introduce our rising leaders. Um, Tess is a senior at Bradley University studying organizational communication management and leadership. And Charmi is in her second year at Barnard College in New York, where she's studying political science and human rights. Charmi and Tess, welcome. Can you talk to us about what's coming up for you in how you are preparing yourselves? What are you thinking and feeling during these times? Um, I think in my certain situation, um, as you guys said before, I'm going into my senior year at Bradley. And so instead of living in a dorm building or last two years I've lived in my sorority house, um, I'm actually going to be living in an off-campus house with about six of my, yeah, six of my friends. And um, so what's really interesting about that is the fact that we will be able to be more cautious because we aren't going to be in those densely populated areas like a dorm building, an apartment building, or a sorority or fraternity house or any other um, on-campus living situation. Um, so I think that gives me a pretty good peace of mind going into the school year. Um, and I know Bradley's been doing a really great job trying to keep students very much updated on the situations on campus. Um, I know earlier this week um, during an orientation session about, I think it was 12 people tested positive on campus. And so we're already having problems before the school year even begins. Um, but I know that they've been doing very rigorous um, contact tracing um, and keeping everybody very much updated. Um, and so I think that my campus in particular has been taking pretty good initiative on things. And I just kind of hope for everybody's safety, whether that's students, faculty, staff, everybody on campus, that those precautions well, everybody sticks to those precautions as the school year begins. I think I'm pretty similar to Tess in terms of like, I have a lot of faith in the school that they're doing the best that they can to make sure that we're all safe. Um, they're, they got one, or not organization, but a company to do like our testing. And then they're getting the Columbia University like school to do the medical center and making sure that contact tracing and such is like in place. But in terms of the social aspect and moving in, that's where I'm a bit more, uh, I don't know if I have a lot of faith in it because it's the freshmen and the sophomores that are coming back. So these are the more like, I'm pretty sure parents or like faculty, they have this idea that we're, the, we're just entering our adulthood and we want to have as much fun as possible. So I don't know if like actual social distancing practices will be in place in the dorm rooms, like will there be parties? Just those types of like anxieties come into mind and I'm worried about those things. But at the same time, I'm excited. Like, you're right. Like, I'll, I'll be coming back to the space that's familiar to me, even if the situation is different. I, I'm hoping that New York will do its job along with the school and like the students on campus that we're not going to mess this up this time. We're going to be going towards like change and like adopting this new normal that's supposed to be in set. Yeah. So for, you know, so for each of you, uh, you know, you're, you're not coming in as newbies, although Charmy, you didn't have the full year experience that you had hoped after all the years that you worked to get to go through school and have your freshman year. Um, so for each of you, you know, what's, what's the wisdom that you're coming back with for, to, to enter this year? Um, I think entering this school year, I think it's going to be very different. As Sharmi said, I think it's going to take a little bit of time for that new normal to kind of be, I guess, present on our campus. Because I know personally, a lot of the people that um, I know aren't necessarily being as safe when it comes to things like social distancing and even wearing masks. Um, and so what I'm really hoping is that, like, Bradley University is such a tight community, as you were talking about before, how important community is on our campus. And that's an aspect of our university that is always very, very much prioritized. People 
love Bradley. One of the reasons I love it so much is because it has such a tight knit community. It's a super small campus. Everybody knows everybody. Um, And so even if there are, I guess, a lot of different opinions floating around campus, um, what I'm really hoping going forward is that people are able to kind of compromise on those opinions and kind of see the greater good that you want to keep these members of your community safe. Like I said before, whether it's students, faculty, staff, you want everybody to be safe. You want everybody to be healthy. You want everybody to be happy and thrive in the university as they have in the past. Um, And so I think it might take a while for that transition to emerge, but I really hope at least by the end of the school year, at least by the end of the first semester, everybody is kind of prioritizing their own health and safety for the greater good of the community on our campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with Tessa's point, especially about the community part. Like, we do have that duty to make sure that everyone is safe and that we try to keep everyone like healthy as possible. But I think in terms of wisdom, especially for like the incoming freshmen, I think I would just suggest to them like reimagine college life, not strictly for like the independence or like the freedom or the parties, but really a place where you can like grow as a person academically. And that doesn't have to happen in terms of like in-person interactions I feel like quarantine has really taught me to connect with people no matter where they are in the world but it's okay you can still grow virtually and you can connect with a lot of people and that doesn't mean you have to put your health like in like as a cost so I think yeah just take advantage of the experience whether that means virtual or like hybrid because I'm definitely going to do that in terms of my academics I was never the type of person to be like Hi, professor. How are you? How are you doing? Like, hope like we can connect. But now I'm like, you know, there's a chance like I can reach them through email. There's a lot of Zoom calls and sessions to make sure that I can learn as a person academically. So I'm definitely going to take advantage of that. I'm, I'm definitely transforming like my image of college campus, not just like my like uh, escape from my parents or like a place away from home, but definitely a place where I can grow as a person and academically as well. And that, that's fabulous because you're you're creating more opportunities through this for yourself, but you're also realizing from not having been able to go to college for the past six months how college life is an opportunity on its own. And rather than just leaving it as an observer, coming in and out of classes as a ghost, to actually feel like, oh, I can engage even more because I have this opportunity. So this year has been special with COVID, but also with Black Lives Matters and the anti-racial movement. So you are going back also to college transformed with more awareness, more education on uh, um, the the history uh, of, of Black American people. So can you tell us, um, Tess and Charmy, how, how, how has that changed you and how will you approach things differently? I guess moving forward, um, I'm a part of our Greek life on campus. And I think that a lot of these racial inequalities are very much prevalent um, throughout our campus, very similar to how it's prevalent throughout the entire nation right now. Um, And so I think that kind of using my own voice in order to spread awareness of how that it's prevalent in our own communities is the best starting point, kind of the best launching point in order to make that a conversation that is happening on our campus constantly. It shouldn't be a once a semester, you sit down and talk about it. It should be, no, that's a topic that you should revisit over and over because it's always going to be important because it's obviously very relevant. And um, I know that there's a lot of organizations on campus that have been leading different um, protests throughout the Peoria area, which is where I, where my college is located. And a lot of students are putting um, kind of their, their efforts in and voicing um, their opinions and going to these different protests. And so it's really great seeing that sort of representation on campus and how much it's really bringing a community of people together. Um, in order to make our campus a safer space. Um, and so I think even in like organizations, even in classes, but also in our personal lives, in our own like smaller friend groups, I know that it's a conversation that 
I feel like needs to be had within the people that I'm living with. Um, just to make sure that, I don't know, it's, it's a conversation that always needs to be ongoing, no matter how small, no matter how large that social or that social circle is. So, yeah. Yes. Do you feel that when you talk about, um, situations that are prevalent in, in your own university, were you not aware of it before? And do you feel that you're more conscious of it now? Yeah, I would have to agree 100%. And I think that really just reflects my own privilege on my college campus. Um, and so I think moving forward, that's a topic that needs to be in the forefront of everybody's brain, especially in situations like myself, where it might not have been something that I thought about all the time. And so um, I think moving forward, um, yeah, I think it's, I think a lot of people are taking the step in the right direction. And those who are not necessarily um, taking that step, there's a lot of ways to encourage people and a lot of ways to help people learn and grow. Um, so, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I have very similar sentiments in regards of like the racial injustice issues. Like Barnard is very known to be a school that takes pride in its like social justice type of like environment and the whole like we advocate for women and that's where we stand. That's why I attended all women's college. We try to amplify those voices. And coming in, I thought it's like, oh, I already have my niche. And that's like women's rights, Filipino community. That's just where I stand. I was very limited in that sense. But then when all these came out and like the Black Lives Matter movement, like all of the information started coming in through social media and it became like, it's not just a trend, but it really is something that affects us in more ways than we can imagine. And coming back on campus, I, I want to be that voice and I want to continue to be that advocate and really learn what it means to be an ally because that's not something that was even in like the grasp of my vocabulary before, what allyship really means. It's not just limited to just be like, oh yeah, I support Black Lives Matter movement, but it really comes down to like educating ourselves and not only keeping our own friends accountable, but even the adults, like having these conversations with my parents, it's like very difficult. But at the same time, I'm like, this matters to me. This matters to a lot of people in the country. As someone that identifies as an Asian American, I am not going to like perpetrate discriminatory attitudes that happens within the community. These are some things that it matters and it's going to matter in the future because I know deep down it's like, I do not want to raise my kids in the future and be like, okay, we're going to continue this trend. I want them to be educated. I want them to grow up to have like those kind values that are not racist and actively anti-racist. And I want them to grow, in, grow up in a society that like really empowers one another the same way like Meshat does, the same way my community does, the same way Barnard does. And that's really what matters in the end for me. <laughs> So for, for this year, uh, do you do each of you have a, um, a specific a goal and aspiration and intention? And if you're comfortable, I would love if you could share that with us. Yeah, I think um, in terms of aspirations going into my senior year, I think the biggest thing that I'm going to prioritize is not only how my academic performance is for my last year, but also how happy I am on campus and kind of finding those different ways to keep myself fulfilled, even though that my senior year is not going to look anything like it did for the past three years. And I think that was something that I was really battling with, really struggling with kind of when we were sent home after spring break and when we learned that maybe some classes would be like hybrid. I know a lot of people were worrying about like, well, I'm not getting the full spectrum of my college experience that I wanted to have in the beginning of my freshman year. And I wanted to have that for all four years. Um, and so I think something that I'm going to push myself to keep reminding myself of is that it's okay for things to change. Change is not a bad thing. Things are always changing around us. And it doesn't matter how much things are changing around us. It just matters how well that I myself can adapt to those things and make the most of it. Um, and so I think I have a sort of personality where I can fall very prone to kind of looking at the negatives of sort of situations. I think sometimes I get into my head, I can get into a very 
pessimistic spiral, especially when changes around me are occurring. And so I think coming back to campus in the fall, I just need to keep reminding myself that this is okay. It's okay that things are different. We're all learning. We're all in a, like a new environment that we're not used to. This isn't what I thought my last year of college is going to look like, but that is also okay. And so validating those emotions that I'm feeling kind of, uh, I guess, like feelings of being upset about how things are going to be different. I, I plan on combating those with, okay, well, how can I adapt better to my surroundings in order to still give myself a very, very fulfilling last year? And so that's what I'm going to the school year kind of challenging myself with is just making the most of what we've got and kind of adapting as well as we can. So, yeah. Sure, me, but uh, what are your thoughts for yourself? Yeah, it's quite similar, but just a different approach. I think since we were all so isolated from quarantine, I felt out of touch in terms of like how I prioritize my mental health. And I know how stressful college environment can be. And like my way to cope last year was just being social, going out with friends more, like experiencing the city. But I know that's not going to be the case when I come back this upcoming semester. So I actually bought a journal. (laughs) <laughs> and I plan on like really using that to not, not only organize my schedule and like see what my goals are, but really reflect on like what it means to be a college student in the middle of a pandemic. And I kind of just want to keep that as a keepsake for myself and look back in the future. It's like, hey, you went through something really, really big during your like younger years and look back at it and be like, you got through it. You got this. And it's kind of just like a way to keep myself pushing forward and like really keep myself like humble and like just let myself and like feel those emotions like what Tess was saying. Dr. Riger, what a beautiful thought to leave our mentees and, and rising leaders with this vision of that what they want to accomplish. And I feel that both of you with these um, projections will go back with a goal. And that's also... Uh, a big part of what takes us through challenging times is the fact that we have an objective. There is something that we're learning here. Um, th- there is a goal that we're setting for ourselves that is realistic. And so last question to close this very inspiring episode. It's for you, Dr. Riker. Where is the silver lining in all of this? What do you think college students will learn about this moment in time that could make them more resilient and emotionally prepared for their own future? One of the challenges of both pandemics, right? Because we have we have two, we have, we've got the double header here, that the challenges I think give us and and not in an out there kind of uh abstract way but it really gives us the silver lining here if there there's if the silver lining and it's not just a silver lining perhaps rather than thinking of it is as a silver lining that it really becomes our imperative as human beings is how how do we grow more how do we become you know even better people on this earth How do we support each other? How do we develop the strengths? And very importantly, that this is an opportunity to really rethink your mindset about yourself. This is an opportunity for all of us to really challenge what some of our beliefs have been and that we don't have to stay in those mindsets anymore. We can expand. We can change things around. We can shift things in and out that we have the the ability and we can have the adaptability. And the word that I want to use is with everything going on, it is so imperative that we find the courage within ourselves that we either knew we had but really didn't have to tap or that we didn't know we have, but it's really there. And for each of us to be where we are at this point in life, It has taken courage. Even if you don't recognize it as such, it has taken courage. And so take a look inside, connect with your courage, own it, tap it, and build it. You can reach me at Dr. R 
at expertinchange.com. And we're thrilled that you joined us today. You welcome to the sisterhood. And as always, we've reserved a seat for you.